Hi everybody, it's Kieran here at Not Just Travel and I'm just going to do my first live on our Instagram page and I'm going to actually join in with a dear friend of mine, um, Victoria Layton, who is um, an hysterical female comedian, a uh, dear friend of mine as well. So I'm just going to find her and add her into the chat if I can work out how to do that. And we're just going to chat about all things travel, um, give this a go. We're hoping that this could become something regular. Um, so let's give it a go, see what happens. All right, you should have an invite on your way. Hello, it works. Hi. Did you just, <laughs> did you just full name me, Victoria Layton? I did. Is that, is that a faux pas, is it? <gasps> no, it's just, uh, I just don't need my mum calls me that. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> At least I got it right this time, unlike your wedding day, where I completely forgot what your married name was. I mean, it's the same as it was. It's, I didn't change it. It's, it's my brand, Kieran. It's my brand. I'm gonna. I, I'm one of those people. I'm a nightmare. Uh, like, yeah. So it, it worked. We did. It worked. It worked. We're live. I've, I've never done this. I've watched many of these in lockdown, as I'm sure you have. But many other yeah. people talking about things on Instagram and various live platforms, but never thought to do one myself. So thank no. you for inviting me to do this. That's right. And the good thing is that it saves automatically at the end. So you mm. just have it on your timeline forever. Mm. Yeah. So people <laughs> didn't get to watch it because they're busy doing Saturday stuff. I mean, I don't know what anyone's doing in England that's exactly. better than this. Because exactly. um, <laughs> we're, we're all stuck in the house. But yeah, because um, you're not, you're not, because we met in Wales, didn't we? But you're not, yes, when originally. You're, you're stuck in as well in Bristol. Yes. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I made the move to Bristol for love, obviously, as you do. Uh, moved over to Bristol, when was it, about four years ago now? Uh, five years ago? So yeah, I am weirdly, I kind of live between the two because obviously like you, I've got family across the border as well. So trying to keep up with quarantine rules at the moment has been an absolute nightmare. I have no idea what the rules are because one minute I'm in England, the next minute I'm in Wales. So. They won't let us back in. <laughs> It's tricky, isn't it? Tricky. So yeah, I haven't seen my mum in a very long time because the rules have just never lined up for when I'm free and she's free to see each other. Um, but yeah, it's made it an interesting couple of months, put it that way. Yeah, because you do travel. So mm -hmm. like yes. last year you put events aside and went, mm -hmm. right, we're going to do this this holiday thing. We feel really strongly about it. And yep. um, then, then there was a pandemic. Yeah. Yeah, like, great timing. <laughs> what's um, yeah? What what happened? Well, like, was... what what happened immediately? Did you get a sense because you're weird, not just travel? Did you mm. did they get a sense that this was bigger than we all thought? Because I thought a couple of months because mm. I booked for Edinburgh Fringe because mm. I was going to mm. do my first solo show, yep. and um, I was pretty confident in February that would be still going ahead right up mm. until I think April, mm. and I was like, oh, mm -mm. this looks quite big. Yeah. Did you did you have any warning? Did you? Any Not really, idea. no. I think we saw certain signs because I think like China went into lockdown first, didn't it? So we kind of saw yeah. signs that something was coming. But I think naively, and again, just because I think travel is an optimistic industry anyway, we're always kind of hoping for the best because that's what we, we do. We celebrate happy things and exciting things. So I think we kind of all as a business personally, but also not just travel who we're kind of part of. I mean, Hayes Travel is a larger kind of part of our business. We would just kind of go in, well, it's business as usual. People are still traveling. As long as there are planes in the sky, we're sending people on those planes type of thing. So it was definitely a shock to all of us to kind of pretty much have our business ultimately closed down overnight for nothing we can do ultimately. If, if like I say, if planes aren't flying, we can't send people. So Cause, yeah. Yeah, because we booked with you in mm -hmm. March, yeah. just before national lockdown for yeah. a holiday in May. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think um, it was like literally up until the last minute, maybe a couple of weeks before, before we even knew whether your holiday would be canceled or not. It was that responsive, I guess is the best word for it. <laughs> Or whether we'd get our money back, which I guess was the bigger thing. Because yeah, um, we that, didn't, that... yeah, it just genuinely didn't occur to us that by May this wouldn't be resolved. We were sent home from work in March and told yeah. you'll be back in two weeks when we deep cleaned the office. Yeah. And um, I haven't been back since. I don't even work there anymore. Yeah. <laughs> That, that was the challenge, I think, when it all happened as well, because obviously the travel industry has never dealt with anything like this. So it's always had refund processes in place, but never at the volume that 
kind of um, happened at the time when kind of lockdown came into place. But then also, as you just said, offices kind of went into lockdown as well. So staff were furloughed for their safety and because everyone was kind of like, well, we don't know what's safe, what we're, not, what we're allowed to do. So you had this really, and unprecedented is a word that got thrown around a lot, but that's what happened ultimately. Well, it's true. Had, <laughs> this is actually the first time it's been appropriate. Honestly, so. like you had <laughs> thousands and thousands of travel staff ultimately and thousands and thousands of refunds to be processed and nobody knew how to deal with that sheer volume of it. Because what is it on travel insurance? Because there's like force, like the force majeure clause that mm. I've seen has been, uh, <laughs> yeah, a lot of people are changing their T's and C's around yeah. that because that exists and that kind of exempts a lot of people from yes. paying out, doesn't it? Yeah. From the insurance point of view. Mm -hmm. but it's one of those mad things where it's like if there's an earthquake or mm. act of god is another yes. phrase for it so yeah, what, yeah, yeah. how how good was everybody about not using that <laughs> um <laughs> insurance companies will do everything in their power to kind of be the last chain i guess to pay out on anything so they will obviously go refer to your travel agents or in our case your tour operator first see what their processes are and again, I think a lot of tour operators we work with who kind of, they're the ones who kind of package on our behalf the holidays and they're the ones who kind of put the flights and the hotels and all that type of stuff for us. Um, they were trying to work out again what to do. They again, didn't know how to deal with this situation themselves. So we did see some tour operators be a little bit lax at the beginning and a little bit hesitant to kind of get behind the industry. And there are so many regulations in place to protect this as well. Like you've got the PTR, which is the package travel regulations. You've got at all protection as well. So every holiday we sell gets both of those protections in place. Those things are I've there. Heard, just... I've heard of at all and it's on travel adverts, but I have no idea what these letters mean. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and it yeah. Was only, <laughs> like, <laughs> and I worked in personal finance for years and like, I was like, oh, make sure your holiday is protected by these letters. But yeah. uh, what, what, what does it mean? <laughs> so at all protection ultimately is kind of something that protects more the airline industry rather than hotels as a whole. But basically the um, Civil Aviation Authority, what are they called here? Oh, God, I keep using American terms for things. Um, this, oh, the people who regulate, I'm going to get this is so bad. I, can't, I got the American acronym. We'll in my come head back to it. It's not a test. It's not a test. <laughs> the people basically, the Civil Aviation Authority in the UK, they um, have worked with kind of this body called Atoll, who ultimately um, wanted to protect package holidays because obviously there are so many different multifaceted elements that go into a traditional package holiday, whether it's as simple as kind of just the flight, the transfer to the resort, the resort itself, and then any excursions you may add on to that. If any one of those elements was failing, people were getting stranded in foreign countries. So they created this at all protection ultimately, which allows basically means that your entire holiday is protected. So if any one part of the chain fails, so say for example, um, the airline goes out of business, which is what happened with Thomas Cook. Literally <laughs> three weeks after we opened our business, Thomas Cook went bankrupt as well. So that was <laughs> an interesting welcome to the travel industry. But that's what it's there to protect ultimately. So if you booked your holiday with us and it was a Thomas Cook package holiday, it meant that you had full protection so that the aviation industry could basically arrange flights to repatriate people who were stranded um, in resort who couldn't get back, but also to make sure people who had forward holidays booked had their money back, uh, refunded back to them as well. Now again- so who funds that? Is that all the airlines together funding? Uh, ultimately, every- How's that? Yeah, because surely that's going to run out. Book, no, it's, it's, it's ultimately is an insurance policy. So every kind of package holiday, so as long as it's an atoll protected holiday, you do pay a small portion into that fund of money ultimately. And then that pot of money sits there for this situation. Um, the word going around was Thomas Cook um, collapse did drain a lot of those funds, um, but there is still a big pot of money in there. Now, what's unique about this situation with the pandemic is it's not an atoll pro problem. At all protects it if a business goes out of business. It doesn't protect it if your flight doesn't go ahead. There's a different regulation that's come into place right. called yeah. package travel regulations that okay. protects kind of whether or not your holiday goes ahead as you planned it or as you booked it. So the package travel regulations came in before I started, but it was about two, three years ago, ultimately. And what that means is you as a consumer, if you buy a package holiday, are entitled to the holiday based on the level you were sold it at. So okay. if you pay for an all-inclusive resort in um, a room that's meant to have so many square feet, it is ultimately the tour operator, the travel agent's responsibility to ensure you get that holiday. Um, so if for whatever reason, again, that hotel goes out of business, Atoll doesn't kick in quite yet because the tour operator has the responsibility to offer you a like-for-like -like comparison. Now, you can negotiate that if you wanted to, so they can say, we will give you this alternative. Are you happy with it? And you've got every right to say, no, we paid for this, we want this, we want our money back. 
Right. And that's kind of, again, so again, they can kind of fight that and everything, but that's what that regulation is there to protect, to make sure you get what you expected and what you paid for. Because like star ratings, for example, so if you've got like a five star all inclusive, mm -hmm. five stars is very broad. Mm -hmm. That is a yeah. broad church. So I went to yes. a five star in <laughs> Tunisia. Mm. And um, I've had better at Butlins. So you, <laughs> like, like, what do you do? I mean, in the good times, when mm. we're back to normal, how do mm. you pick a holiday? Because obviously the ratings for me now mean mm. nothing. Mm -hmm. But also TripAdvisor is like yeah. a just bag of worms that I don't want to open. <laughs> like, well, people are like, one star because like, there weren't enough chips. Like, yeah, there well, weren't chips with the meals. It was all like, it's a Greek Greek holiday. And they're like, mm. oh, it was too much, too much better. Like... <laughs> <laughs> This is it's the thing, really though. So TripAdvisor is fantastic. I love using it. And I always use it as a resource to kind of just check. But you need to keep in mind that TripAdvisor is like Wikipedia. Anybody with an ounce of thought can go on TripAdvisor and leave a comment. So you're not necessarily getting a true representation of what that resort or that destination is like. You're getting a crowdsourced opinion. And bear in mind, everyone is different as well. And this is kind of where, again, I can't, I know I'm selling myself, but a travel agent will help you with this ultimately. Yeah, that's um, the first thing I asked you, because that's why like, we booked with you, because there was just so many hotels offering exactly the same thing, you know, the yeah. same looking blue pool, the same view, yes. yeah. the rooms they want to show you are the best yeah. ones. Obviously they're all like Grecian and Collins yes. and white, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you don't, you don't get that. And they were always. all taken the week and the like... resort opened when it was pristine and lovely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> so and you that's... had a lot, you had a better view on that than we did. So I was sending you links going, what about this? You're like, oh, no, yeah. they've, been, they've not been refurbished for 10 years. So what is it? How, um, how do you know this stuff? Well, this is the thing. So I spend, and even before lockdown was going on, kind of travel agents spent a ton of time on kind of Zoom calls, going to kind of training events with the different brands and suppliers. And we have kind of a one-to-one -one connection with the business development managers for a lot of these brands. And it could be as big as like Disney. So Disney's a big They're not going to tell you their hotels are bollocks though, are they? That's They're the not, thing. no. But <laughs> you learn through those relationships where they will give you the honest path to it type of thing of All like, right. I had a good one as well with Cancun of like, it's not a destination I've ever had any experience in. I've never been, but I've done a lot of training with kind of one of the suppliers who have amazing resorts there, um, Grand Palladium Group. And I just got to ask me questions of like, where's really great places to eat nearby? Um, what would you recommend? This is the couple I got, I'm working with. They're this type of people. They like adventure. They want to do this. Is this going to be the right resort? And it's in their interest to say in the nicest way, we're not the right brand for that couple maybe you should try these alternative options because we're more kind of leisure and luxury rather than Because they don't adventure. want a bad review. So they'd no. rather not have someone come and like moan all the time. Exactly. So, which, not saying that's the kind of person I am, but... <laughs> But I think in this modern world as well, that's that's what they want. They want people to kind of make sure they get in the holiday they want. They don't want people kind of, like you say, go in there and having a bad time and maybe never going back. Just because at this particular point in time where that couple's looking for an adventure holiday, that resort wasn't right for them. That's not to say in two, three years time, they may go, I would love to sit on a beach for a week and drink cocktails. That would be a dream for me. So they, they'd rather kind of sell, and we are firm believers of selling the right holiday to the right customer. There is a holiday for everyone. It's just finding out what that is for you. Cause I don't know what I want. I always think I want the <laughs> beach holiday. Like, and I, I get four days in, I'm like, ah, I want to go home. <laughs> so but then that, that's, that's what <laughs> I've learned type of thing. And that's what a good travel agent will do. They'll listen to you and kind of pick out and try and work out with you a hierarchy of what matters. Because like, you know, for me personally, I'm not necessarily a luxury traveler, but I like something a little bit more than standard. But I'm also a big drinker. So alcohol is kind of the priority of can I get drunk easily and regularly? Premium spirits as well. I yes. don't want the stuff they brew in a shoe. In a... <laughs> <laughs> like so that... unlimited, like, because like wine is a massive problem for me. I know this is a very personal problem. But like none of the wines on all-inclusive. I've mm. not found a single hotel. If you could find me an all-inclusive hotel where the mm. wine was nice, yeah, I would pay more. <laughs> this is the thing, this is the thing. And that's, that's where though I get to again, because I've got these relationships with these BDM managers, you know, and the kind of managers of the resorts. I can ask them kind of, can you send me over the wine list? My customer's really passionate about wine. Can you send it to me type of thing? You know, it's- Well, no, that... the wine list, Kieran, is red, white and rosé. Sometimes <laughs> not even rosé. Um, I because I, when we went to Mexico, it was supposed to be, it was really luck. So we did the sort of Cancun experience. It was quite luck, mm. but 
they're so used to everybody only wanting stuff for free and it happened yes. to me in Dubai as well because we yeah. were on a, it was like an all-inclusive in a Marriott and it was gorgeous mm. I wanted a cocktail that wasn't on the menu mm. and instead of giving me the cocktail they assumed that I they tried to make it with the ingredients that were on all-inclusive really? which is amazing service I just wanted like yeah. they're so used to people not wanting to pay anything extra I it's, think that it's, I think it's, this is a cultural thing as well, though. Yeah. I will be honest, it's a British thing. <laughs> and um, Brits, when we go abroad, we kind of don't like to have hidden charges. <laughs> we like to kind of go, I paid my dues, I'm here. <laughs> so I was like, I paid the for. other way, tell me the charges. <laughs> like, I tried to, bo to buy a bottle of wine off the menu and they just couldn't believe it. They were like, mm. there is wine available. I was like, it's okay. <laughs> Like, I brewed it in a shoe. <laughs> it tastes like the perfume you used to make when you were a kid. You used to yeah, smell. Yeah. You know, when you're, like, smashing up grass and rose petals, and you're like, oh, this is going to be delicious. This for you. <laughs> it's, the, it's the drink equivalent. And, um, yeah, I think they went and got it out of a basement. So, no one had ever asked for it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they went out, like, someone got on a little moped and went and bought it in the shop. It took <laughs> Probably. Hours <laughs> to get this wine. <laughs> it, was like, it was Libramilch in its quality but for me mm. after two weeks of drinking the shoe wine because every day i'd be like how bad can it be <laughs> um, you've yeah. got to go back and check just to get yeah it. just maybe yesterday i did my, my taste didn't work. maybe it um, was the heat it made it yeah. taste different <laughs> it's a glass i like it so in a glass glass but yeah it tasted like like yeah i felt like beyonce they treated me like beyonce they're like you want to spend 20 pound on a wine when the shoe wine is free yeah right it is, it's unfortunately is a reputation that we just have as British tourists that that's the expe expectation a lot of people have. They're actually quite shocked if you are on an all-inclusive that you kind of want to pay off the all-inclusive package. And it's just Another fighting one, that yeah. perception. <laughs> Another thing I learned in Mexico is Americans tip for everything. So even though it's free, they yeah. were happy to pay. Yes. So we never yeah. got tipped. This and is we, and we would have tipped. We would have tipped. But they yeah. assumed we wouldn't. So they didn't even yeah. ask. So I stood there because I'm an awkward tipper. Yes. But there was like my, my my Mexican money in my hand ready. But they didn't even give me the eye. They literally weren't even willing to make eye contact with me because yeah. all the Americans were just throwing down yeah. dollars, yeah. dollars, dollars, dollars. And I was like, I've got dollars too. <laughs> I think this is the thing that we as Brits have to realise that we do have a stereotype. <laughs> other people in other countries do stereotype British travellers. like value. <laughs> It's, it's one of those things, though, and it's something that comes up quite a lot, because, again, this big Disney obsession I've got, it's a constant conversation within, like, the Disney community and Disney travellers of what should you tip for when you go abroad? And you do find, that, and like you say very much that, of you get treated differently <laughs> because they know British people don't tip as well as Americans. <laughs> and that's I've like, learned that's that That's our day one strategy now. Every time there's a chance to tip, we tip in case word gets wrong. Like... <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Phil's got American family, and the first thing she ever said to us when we started going out drinking with her, when we met, went and stayed with her in Miami, she was like, right, find a barman, tip him well at the beginning of the night, and keep to that one barman for the entire night, and he will look after you. And it's revolutionized my drinking experience when in America, because, yeah, absolutely. Once they kind of cotton on to, oh, okay, you know how this works. Yeah, these are the tips we need, Kieran. Oh, <laughs> I was talking about this stuff. <laughs> absolutely, this, this is, it's been a big conversation. It's my biggest tip to anyone who goes to America, tip well, because that you will get looked after and that's the difference. There are some resorts where they're very aware of British culture. A lot of the more international, like Disney's great at being very aware of British guests aren't comfortable tipping. It's just not something we're used to. And it's a bit of an awkward, like, thank you peasants for serving me. We've got that kind of perception towards tipping. I think um, it's the job, like, the, the perception of the job, though, isn't it? Because in yes. America, it's a career job. So you yeah. see, I, you know, I, I saw a lot of old, the first time I went to the US, I saw a lot of older servers. And at the time, mm -hmm. I was like, oh, that's a, that's a shame yeah. that, you know, they're, they're having to do that in the sort of 60s and 70s. But mm -hmm. it's a choice because yeah. it can be very, very lucrative. Whereas yeah, yeah. here, serving it's... jobs have sort of stereotypically been students and... yes. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Even, so Americans... even even the professionals, it's just like it's not necessarily respected by everybody in the way that it should be because it's damn hard. No, well, this is <laughs> the thing. not I think... an easy job. I I'm no good at doing this. Oh, I'm I'd be rude. awful. I'm I would too be. Rude. Yeah. Um... <laughs> I definitely would have a passive aggressive relationship with service. Definitely. Yeah. I, I've I got so not... much time respect for anyone with the patience to do that. So, no, no. But... Like, we're big cocktail drinkers and we make cocktails quite a lot. But after I've made one, 
I lose interest. And when it comes to making cocktail too, they get sloppier and sloppier. And I'm like, oh, it's fine. It's gonna all gone. I just drink it. <laughs> I don't need to measure anymore. <laughs> Honestly, I would be terrible because I would just be like, oh, I've served this person once. What more could they want? No. Yeah. Leave me alone. I'm busy. But see, honestly, I, I, yeah, I'd be terrible. So I, and I think, I think, um, yeah, British people have got that in them that it's like a low status job, even though it's not, it's a completely legit job. Whereas I don't think America's got that service job no. is a service. Service job industries is. are so much more respected. I think in America, people yeah. in America, they value service. I think it's just ingrained into them as a culture and that everyone jokes about kind of, oh, everyone's so fake in America and like, why are they so over the top and everything? But it's because they really value service culture. You know, if you look at some of the great brands like Apple and what they've done to revolutionize kind of the Apple store and the consumer experience, it's because service is at the heart of the product rather than it being the product kind of first. Whereas we just don't have that mentality. Like you walk into a store in America and like, oh, hey, how are you doing? Anything I can help you with? Or you're looking for something in particular? Before you even kind of get in the shop, they're asking you, can I help you get through this experience faster? As and we're not used to that. We're no. just like, no. No, I, no I, I'm just looking at no, thank you. No, we feel no. like they, because for us, I it think feels it's like a hard sell. Well, it feels mm. like a hard sell immediately because yeah. people who are direct, British salespeople who are direct, are direct. Absolutely, they want they want your money. Whereas, like, yes. yeah, I couldn't quite cope with people genuinely wanting to be helpful. Yeah, it, it's a culture <laughs> shock. I, it's it's a funny thing. Like, so when I first went to America, I thought America was going to be kind of Little Britain, <laughs> not the TV show, <laughs> not Little Britain. Sorry, Big Big Britain. I thought it was just going to be everything we have, just bigger and more. And that is true. That is very, very true. There are a lot of similarities with our two cultures. The more I visit, though, and the more of kind of America I see, the more I see the differences in kind of how different America is compared to the UK. And just kind of the culture is a big, big one. American culture is very, very different. And then you get into like cuisine, you get into kind of history and heritage, art and culture. There are so many differences. And I love nothing more now than exploring kind of new parts of America and seeing kind of the nuances as well, because every single state is... is a huge contrast as well from one another for such and you now understand as well why america is such a hard country for it to kind of seem unified is because it's not it is so vastly different just traveling across the state borders the next day to cross you've got a whole history a whole culture cuisine is vastly different even the climate and the temperature is completely different and i just i love that now of kind of like visiting america and seeing a new a new destination and kind of going right what's this about what's your history why did this become this way and why do you eat your food this way and i don't know i just love that and i think it's that i, I don't know as you more, as you experience more and more of a culture you kind of become in awe of it but definitely i've learned america is very different to the uk very different how people just fundamentally think and see the world is very different well, oh, we're, gonna... <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna do this again on tuesday because it's just a test so i don't want to yes. spoil it too much but i guess yeah. um for the sake of anybody who watches this video, what do they need to know about travel right now? Like, mm. should we be booking a holiday? What, what do we do? Like, Definitely. What... Now is a great time because ultimately um, what's happening is demand is picking up. Definitely, 100%. I've seen it. We've all seen it. People are starting to inquire. The news of um, a vaccine come in has definitely kind of stimulated kind of travel. What's happening at the moment is 2021 is having people from 2020, sorry, people from 2020 are, are moving their holiday, sorry, to 2021. So a lot of that kind of limited availability rooms like twin rooms, oh, yeah. family rooms, swim up rooms, um, premium rooms, all the kind of top tier stuff is going. Um, a lot of the great offers are going as well because basically people are just lifting and moving their holidays across. So there is less availability. At the moment, suppliers and tour operators are being really flexible as well. So if you are someone who wants to book for next year, but you're a bit concerned of is now the right time or I'm not sure if it's going to be ready to travel by June, July, definitely now is the time to think about it because there's so many flexible terms in place that I promise you won't be there as we move into next year type of thing because they'll want to lock in that price and that money. And what about people who are waiting to see if it gets cheaper? Because obviously, I think there's a mindset, isn't there, from people that, yes. oh, the travel industry will be desperate to get back on its feet. Yeah. We're going to get yeah. a really good deal. Let's leave it till yeah. right at the edge. Is that yeah. bollocks? Or? Possible, <laughs> but I, I highly doubt you're going to find kind of last minute deals type of thing. Obviously, every brand is different. You may find someone will have rooms available and they'll shift a load of itinerary last minute to get rid of it. Um, but on the whole, I don't think you're going to save a massive amount by waiting. Now, is, is the, the offers are now, basically, because they want the money now. 
once people are actually traveling and getting on the planes and can go and people are booking, it's not in their interest to kind of give you a good deal ultimately because the demand is there. Now is definitely the time. While kind of the demand is definitely there, I'm not underplaying it. Cruise for next year is selling incredibly well, which is a shock to people. Why, why is that? Because that's people literally in a tin mm. of potential mm -hmm. virus. Why mm. are cruises selling better? What, what? If you have the cruise bug, you have you, the cruise bug. Right, and I, I did it. I, the, our first cruise was the honeymoon. We sailed the Caribbean with Disney. And it's set off a monster in me to the point that we've got three cruises potentially booked for next year now. So going from never sailed to sailing once to three in a year. Um, it's just, you. I think everyone should experience a cruise once in their life. And I think if you've been on a cruise ship, you know the level of detail they go to to keep those ships clean. What happened yeah. at the beginning of the pandemic was a really unfortunate case with Princess Cruise Lines. I think they've become almost kind of a figure of kind of this is why it's bad and this is why people shouldn't do this. Um, That's totally, was, I bought into that. I was like, yeah, why would anyone do that? That's crazy. Um, it was because yeah. they wouldn't let people off the ship. They kept them on the ship. And again, it was as we didn't have enough information to know that that was a bad thing to do. It wasn't the case of the cruise ship was a bad place to be. It was how they kept everyone on the cruise ship in the same space without knowledge of how this virus spreads that kind of exploded that situation. But we all and, did. We all did the equivalent absolutely. of that in our houses, in our shows, like the shows that I set up. Like yeah. I was doing comedy shows right down to the wire because yeah. we didn't really understand yeah. the implications of that. So. Absolutely. But cruise ships, I would sail tomorrow. Honestly, cruise ships are like we had an outbreak of um, the norovirus on our Disney cruise and it happens more than people would think ultimately. But I promise you, you're walking down the kind of um, staircase and there's someone behind you cleaning, anti-backing the staircase, just to make sure it's clean. There's people outside the toilets waiting to clean the toilets for you. Uh, once you come out of them type of thing. It's a bit weird at first. You've been like, let me finish. You know. Yeah. <laughs> peace of mind of knowing like this ship, I, I, we were never afraid of catching A, the norovirus on that ship but also of kind of ever sailing again and being afraid. Ships are cleaner than most hotels, most resorts. They're cleaner than any place you could go. Honestly, I would sail tomorrow if I could. Well, I, I'm hoping to sail as soon as possible. <laughs> so when, when, when sh if people are cautious, when mm. does it feel not safe to start booking, mm. but how soon should they be looking in the calendar mm. for things to be a bit more stable? Would you it, like next, do you think next summer? What's the yeah. vibe? Yeah, definitely next summer onwards. April seems to be popular. So kind of some people are risking kind of from now. We've got people who are flying to kind of Dubai over winter as well for a winter break. So that's just come on the air corridor list. And um, the, uh, the Canary Islands are great as well. We've got people traveling now. So kind of people who are getting winter sun if they haven't been away this year. We've got some traveling now. Majority of people are planning kind of um, kind of April onwards, I guess, is where the bulk of bookings are at the moment. Because I think that's far enough away to kind of give it a go and see what happens ultimately. Yeah. Um, but again, going back to kind of those flexible terms, we've got really low deposits of £60 per person. So to kind of just pay £60 to have your holiday booked in at a great price, and then yeah. basically knowing you can cancel it up to, some of our suppliers have got literally two days before you're travelling, you can cancel if you change your mind. So you can kind of book something in now, knowing you've doesn't got something to look forward to. doesn't feel very risky then, no. does it? No, so... absolutely not. Cool. Well, that was a really nice little teaser for mm. Tuesday. Mm. So mm. Um, I think we've both got some stuff to think about. So I guess I will see you. Tuesday evening. We haven't yes. decided what time yet, but not uh, yet. We need to sort that out. Thanks. Definitely. It's been really cool. fun. All right. I'll speak to you soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.